I'm John Heilman. And I'm Mark Halpern. With all due respect to Donald Trump's glide path to the nomination, sometimes things can look a little bit like an obstacle course. They're going to take me under a fence, through a field. Oh, you have no idea the route they have planned for me to get out of here. Do we have a money show for you tonight? We will get Jane Sanders' two cents on her husband's campaign. We'll ask Ben Ginsburg the GOP's million dollar question. And Ted Cruz is one pence, none the richer. <laughs> but first, all that glitters is not gold for Donald Trump in the Golden State. For the second day in a row, protesters clash with police outside a Trump event in California, which holds its delegate rich primary on June 7th. Today, protesters delayed a Trump speech at the Repu California Republican Convention by swarming the venue in Burlingame, just south of San Francisco, surmounting barricades and charging past police officers toward the hotel where Trump was scheduled to speak. And that was about 400 miles up the coast from Costa Mesa, where last night anti-Trump protesters scuffled with Trump supporters, blocked an intersection, and broke the windows of a police car. At least 17 protesters were arrested. Mark, we have seen a violence associated with Trump events in the past. Given this was in California, given where we are in the race, what do you think these incidents suggest, if anything, about what we can expect to see ahead of the California primary and a little later even in the context of the Republican convention? That there are a lot of people in this country who do not like Donald Trump and want to express their First Amendment position on that. Fantastic. That law enforcement is going to rack up a lot of bills trying to protect uh, uh, order and that um, this spectacle and the possible violence that could occur is going to be a reality for the Trump campaign as long as he's in the race. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's a, it's a problem for Trump. And, and some of it is of his own making and some of it is not. And it's not all to be laid at his feet. But, you know, for, if, if what you're trying to do right now is to reassure a lot of Republicans um, who are mainstream Republicans, not just the so-called establishment, but just Republicans. We're going to talk more about this later in the show. But if you're trying to reassure those folks, not just that you can win a general election, but that you can hold the party together, that you can be the kind of nominee that everyone can be proud of, that you're not going to be a constant font of chaos all around you. These kinds of images, again, no matter who's to blame, these images just have a negative, unsettling effect on a lot of the kind of people that Donald Trump wants to speak to and reassure right now. He says he's a unifier. Yes. And these are not symbols of unity. And I think, I think the Republican Party, as they plan the convention before there's a presumptive nominee that they turn the reins over to, really has to think about how Cleveland's going to work. Because Cleveland is going to produce hundreds, thousands, thousands of, protesters? of protesters and the fact that violence can break out even when these are not these are not events that are pop up events. Right. The authorities knew people were coming right. and yet they still could not keep order. Right. And, you know, I'll say, you know, and I'm were, not blaming the authorities. I'm just saying it's just the reality fact. of the it's situation. And, and here's the other thing is that, you know, we had a period there. Um, I, I'm now my mind is so porous that I can't remember exactly when this was, but there was a period there. Um, after Super Tuesday, around Super Tuesday, when there were a lot of these things happening around Trump. Chicago was the most famous example. But it seemed to kind of subside for a while. This California thing, obviously, is bringing it back to the fore. And, you know, it, it is, a, again, there, there, there's, there's just, again, there's blame to go around here, right? But in Cleveland, you know, dealing with this in a way that seems to give, that, that does give protesters the legitimate right to speak. Um, while not looking like you have to impose a martial law, a police state. Yeah. You know, you, you don't want chaos in the we, streets, right. but you also don't want, you know, guys on yeah. horseback spent, in riot gear. We spent months, They're both unsettling. We spent months saying, well, this isn't going to hurt Trump for the nomination, but it could hurt him in the general. We're now at the period where you got to start thinking about these things in the context of the general, and this is, these are great, not great images for the gen winning in general election. Right. All right. Indiana's Republican governor, Mike Pence, was widely expected not to put his finger on the scale ahead of his state's primary on Tuesday for any candidate. But this afternoon, in an interview with local radio host Greg Garrison, Governor Pence gave one of the most wishy-washy and widely mocked expressions of support by an elected official in this presidential race so far. The governor lavished as much praise on Donald J. Trump billionaire, who he didn't say he'd vote for, as he did for the candidate he says he will vote for, Texas Senator Ted Cruz. 
I like and respect all three of the Republican candidates in the field. Um, I, I particularly want to commend Donald Trump, uh, who I think has has given voice to the frustration of, of millions of working Americans with a lack of progress in Washington, D.C. And, and I'm also particularly grateful uh, that Donald Trump has, a, has taken a strong stand for Hoosier jobs. Let me say, I, I've come to my decision about who I'm supporting, and I'm not against anybody, but I will be voting for Ted Cruz in the upcoming Republican primary. I respect the right and the views of every Hoosier in making their determination in the upcoming primary election. All right, so as wishy-washy as that was, clearly it's not an announcement that's going to hurt Ted Cruz, but with just four days left before the Hoosier State votes, all the polling data that we've seen, other indications suggest Trump remains in the lead. So, John, with this backing, as soft as it is, of, uh, of Pence and what else is going on in the state, can Cruz close the gap and win in Indiana, which if he does not, most people say the race is over. Well, the biggest uh, positive of this uh, is that after some days in which uh, Cruz was roundly mocked, including on this show, for a bunch of gimmick, gimmicks and gambits that seem very desperate, from the alliance to the Carly Fiorina thing, this is a normal thing. Like you getting an endorsement from the state's didn't governor. Get an endorsement. I know. He I understand. Didn't. I understand. But just let me finish. All I'm saying is like this was not a bad thing for him. No. And uh -huh. the other things were mockable. Yeah. This is like, well, you know, you got the you got a semi endorsement. A, a lot of the endorsements Cruz have gotten from other people, like Mitt Romney, who said he was going to vote for him but didn't really endorse him. A lot of those things have been like that for Cruz. This was a good day for Ted Cruz in a limited sense. I do not think this will make a, any difference in what happens in the primary on Tuesday. Zero difference. Not very much. And not such a good day. I well, mean, but, but a better day than having had three horrible yeah. days, four horrible I mean, days in a row. It's fascinating because... because yeah, a terrible week. Because it's still not clear why Pence did this. It did makes no do, sense. If, did, did he do it at all for his own politics? Did he do it only for his own politics? He faces re-election this year. Yeah. Or did he do it in some way because he wants to stop Trump? as soft as that was. Doesn't seem like he does. He, he lavished nice plays things about on Trump. Trump. If the, he wants the, to stop Trump, yeah. that, if that really was his objective, he failed miserably with yeah. that. What's interesting is on Monday, Trump and Christie went to Indiana and met with Pence. Right. Uh, Christie knows Pence quite well, helped right. him get elected, and, uh, and wanted to introduce Trump and, 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 the, and the governor. And they left that meeting where Trump seemed pretty confident that he would either get the endorsement yes. or Pence would stay neutral. Listen to what Trump said on Wednesday, two days after he met face to face with Mike Pence. The governor is a great guy. I've met with him. Uh, he may not endorse. I don't think he'll endorse anybody, actually. He's, uh, he, and he may endorse us. I, I don't know. He, he's a great guy. Right. So, so far, both in his remarks in California and on Twitter, as far as we know, Trump has not said a word one about this. Normally, if somebody endorses one of his rivals, he lashes out. It's going to be fascinating to see if he does. But this is a strange twist in Trump's seeming march to consolidating support. Right, and you know, we both know on the basis of our reporting that Trump, Christie, and the people around Trump were convinced that after that meeting, that at a minimum they would hold, that they had succeeded in holding Pence neutral, and that at the most optimistic that he might endorse Trump, as again, as that quote reflects, that, as that soundbite reflected. So it's a very strange thing, and I, again, I, I, it also strikes me as really out of character for Pence, because Pence is not normally a wishy-washy yeah. guy. That's not his Cruz, character. Cruz is working the state hard. He's got Pence's backing now, and there's some ads on TV, but man, he's got a very limited amount of time to close a gap, which is not insignificant right now. Right. All right, later in the program, we're going to talk to Jane Sanders about the state of the Democratic nominate, nomination fight. But up next, some Republicans are trying to decide between their party and their personal convictions when it comes to the question of whether to support Donald Trump. We're going to discuss that very important issue and a lot more when we come back. We're now about 100 hours away from the Indiana primary, which could solidify the status of Donald J. Trump billionaire as the GOP's presumptive nominee. With that impending eventuality comes the most central debate of this 2016 presidential race going forward. Will Republicans coalesce behind the party's most controversial nominee in a generation? Or will Republicans with deep moral and or ideological objections to Trump as their standard bearer follow personal conscience over party loyalty? Many of our media colleagues have been reporting out and wrestling with this subplot.
We have a story up right now on BloombergPolitics.com by Laura Litvin, who quotes Senator Orrin Hatch, saying he'll do anything in his power to help Trump in a general election. And one of our pals at The Washington Post, Phil Rucker, who was on yesterday, has a story out today that quotes several Republican insiders, including former Republican governor of Minnesota and presidential candidate Tim Pawlenty, who described the shifting party dynamics bluntly. Quote, the hysteria has died down, and the range of emotion is from resignation from, to enthusiasm, end quote. Now, the never Trump side was crystallized today by New York Times columnist David Brooks, who wrote that Republican leaders are, quote, going down meekly and hoping for a quiet convention. They seem blithely unaware that this is a Joe McCarthy moment. People will be judged by where they stood at this time. Those who walked with Trump will be tainted forever after, after the degradation, for the degradation of standards and the general election slaughter. Mark, um, this is a deeply personal and complicated debate for many people. So what, if anything, will change the contours of the long-running tension over Republicans can in good conscience rally around Donald Trump. Never been anything like this in our careers, maybe in American history, of a guy who's on the doorstep of being a major party nominee who faces emotional, intense, heartfelt criticism from people in both his party and in the other party. It is on social media, it is on cable TV, it is on talk radio, it is intense, and everybody in the country is going to have to learn to respect the views of others on this, because if Trump's the nominee, it's going to go all the way through November. I think that what's going to happen if Trump wins Indiana is some respected voices in the party are going to come forward and say in a calm way, this is it, get on board, he's our nominee, we've got to make the best of it. And that's going to be up to Trump to see if he can unify first his party and then the country. But this is, a, this is an emotional thing. I see it in my life every day, in my Twitter feed every day. We hear it in our office. People are really emotional about Donald Trump and what right. he stands for and what right. he's done. Right. Well, okay. So. The first thing is that I think a lot of what happens going forward will depend on how Trump conducts himself um, going forward. You are rightly, I believe we both agree about this, if you're a presidential candidate, and especially the nominee of your party, you will be judged and should be judged and scrutinized on the basis of your entirety of your life in politics and in public life. So Donald Trump, those things cannot go away. You know, things Donald Trump did in the past, um, being a prime exponent of the birther theory against Barack Obama, um, other things that he has done in the past that have made people think that he is racially insensitive at worst and potentially racist at, at or ra racially insensitive at best and racist at worst. Those things will be in his history forever. Um, comments about rapists and Mexicans, the things that he has said that have offended women, um, those things will be in his history forever. But And I just say on that, Trump supporters need to be sensitive to how offensive Tens those, of millions of Americans find those find, things. Find they those just things. have to be sensitive. Find to that. those things, and and the reality is that you know you have things where reporters now write things, and and they're sometimes subject to abuse. We are subject to abuse from both sides. Um, abuse from Trump supporters if we are seen as critical, and uh, as by Trump haters if we say anything remotely positive about Trump. About just like this is a smart campaign gambit. People come after us and say that we're enabling Trump, or that we love Trump, or that we want Trump to win. All is ridiculous. But the truth is. Trump will be judged correctly by the totality of things he's done and said. He can't escape his past and the things that he says now are in the context of that past. However, he can conduct himself in a way that will, that will somewhat ameliorate some of these problems if he tries to stay within the, what we consider pr the norms that should govern our political discourse related to minorities and related to women. If he, if he, if he, plays, if he plays better, He'll ameliorate if he continues down. If he continues to say some things that are as inflammatory as in the past, this is never going to get better. Whether, never gonna whether get better. he's running against Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton, he will be the story. He will be the center of attention. Okay. As you said, his conduct will determine some of it. But I believe a lot of this now is baked in. The Trump supporters brook no dissent, no criticism, right. and the Trump opponents look at anything he does through the filter of that he's a bigot and a racist and a horrible man. And that includes many people in the press who, rather than being objective, have become virulent anti-Trump advocates, which I find bizarre. Right, and they should not, and they certainly should not do that. And I'll say, you know, the thing about it that's not going to go away also, you know, people like Mitt Romney, they're never going to vote for Donald Trump. And there are a lot of major, mainstream figures in the Republican Party who have come to the conclusion that it's not morally or ideologically accept, accept, acceptable, no matter what he does going forward. And Trump can make it better, but those people will still be there, and that's going to be the backdrop against the country's this country's going to plays out. have to learn to respect strong views that they don't hold. Gosh, that's uh, really quite a fond hope, but i um, not sure it's going to come to pass. All right, when we come back, Jane Sanders, the wife of Bernie Sanders, joining us after these words from our sponsors.
Earlier today, we were wondering what the top people at Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign are thinking about the Democratic race and the senator's path to the nomination. So we decided to call in a Sanders campaign expert for a little bit of help. So joining us now is just such a person from our Washington Bureau, Jane Sanders. Jane Sanders, thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Um, so if your husband fights back, becomes the Democratic nominee, talk what, about what you think his vision is for the Democratic convention that he would help plan and preside over. How would it be different from past recent Democratic conventions? Well, I think uh, he would be talking about the issues very strongly, about laying out a progressive vision for the future. You've heard his, uh, his platform uh, talking about accessible higher education, a national uh, health care plan, a minimum wage that is $15 an hour. He'll also be talking about electoral reform so that we have, uh, we increase our voter turnout and we in increase the number of people in the Democratic Party. He'll be talking about how we need to shut the revolving door from lobbyists to corporate interests to campaign donors and the executive and the legislative branches. Um, there'll be a, let, let a number ask, of things. Let me ask you about that very thing. At past, recent, and historically all modern Democratic <laughs> conventions, corporate lobbyists have access to suites within the convention hall and can mingle with politicians. Is that something you'd see at a Bernie Sanders convention in Philadelphia, or would corporate lobbyists not be welcome? No, I think that uh, if Bernie wins the nomination, it will be at the convention. So there will be a lot of people already there. And, uh, you know, I mean, maybe Ben and Jerry will have a suite there. <laughs> um, Jane, uh, the other day, uh, your, your husband was on television with, uh, with Mark, among others, and was asked about uh, the vice presidential question. And he said that it would be great to have a woman on the ticket. Uh, and he mentioned Elizabeth Warren as one potential person who would be maybe a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, can you name any other uh, women who you think would make great uh, potential running mates for your husband? Oh, I think I would not be. You, I should not answer those questions. Oh, you certainly Elizabeth should. You certainly great. should. Come on. <laughs> Just give us one I more know, name. I know, I know. I talk to you guys too much. Uh, no. No. Okay. Um, so again, there's this uh, at least somewhat awkward situation where, as you just said, if, if your husband's going to be the nominee, it's going to happen in July at the convention. But if it happens, then he's going to be on the doorstep of a general election that'll be pretty spirited. So today, Secretary Clinton's campaign announced state directors in three important battleground states. Is your campaign planning to do that? Do you have planning underway for how a general election would work? Or is that just going to start from a standing start in July if you win? No, no. We're, of course, very aware of what has to happen in a general election. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, and we've got people in place, and we'll see what happens. We're not going to move past this primary system, primary um, election right now. We're focused on Indiana and Kentucky and Oregon and California and Puerto Rico. Uh, so we're focusing on that. But we've got people in place in all the states, and that's one of the reasons. We need, we have, we've gone uh, in 40 states. We need 10 more states that we have to work with and make sure that every single person has the right to um, vote for the candidate of their choice and also express their wishes for the agenda but just, but going just, forward, just to be, and we're meeting yeah. with people. Okay, so just to be clear, I know you don't know exactly what the Clinton campaign is, is doing for the general election, but could you tell Democrats who, you know, one of your big talking points is you'd be stronger in a general election. Can you assure Democrats who are worried about that, concerned about that, that you have done as much planning or will be just as prepared to wage a general election fight as Hillary Clinton's campaign? We will be just as prepared and stronger but in a different way. I mean, we have not run this election in the cookie cutter way. We haven't done things the same same way that most candidates have. We've been, as you've seen, you know, really bringing people out and exciting them, inspiring them about moving forward and and thinking differently about what a government of the people, by the people, and for the people could mean. You know, uh, and so there, we're talking about specific issues, but we're also talking about our broader vision for America. Um, so when you look at every one of the polls, Mark, and I know, I know you guys really spend a lot of time looking at these things. I don't spend a lot, but for the last three months, it's been very clear that Bernie always does better against all the Republicans than Secretary Clinton does. And the reason for that is because he brings out not just, I mean, the Democratic nominee will bring out the Democratic base. The, uh, the, but Bernie would also bring out a lot of independents and 
he he gets some of the Republicans, and if Trump is the nominee, some of the Republicans are not going to want to go there. And in in his Senate race, he got 25 percent of the Republican vote in Vermont. You know, the old common sense rock ribbed Republicans, not the new. Trump Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, Jane. Um, I want to talk a little bit about taxes now, um, and I want to talk about a couple couple of comments you made. Um, first, you, you were on this <clears throat> show, I believe, on April 11th, and you were asked about uh, your family's tax returns. Uh, a couple weeks yeah. later, uh, you were on a different network on a different program. I want to play the sound for you here from the two different things. Okay. Two different well, wait. Let's just let's let's have time to actually talk about. Issues, but I will tell you, our taxes are done, and they're at an accountant because I know you guys are going to look through them with a fine-tooth comb. Or if you are not, then David Brock is, and the you know the many many other people. So don't worry about it. Our taxes are being checked, and we'll be out. But we did put out the 2014 right, right away. Right. I, so don't worry about that. Let's well, move on to real issues. Well, I still I got to follow up on this question. So you're, 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 you say your, your taxes will be out. So the other day you suggested that you were not going to put your taxes out until Hillary Clinton had released her speech transcripts. <clears throat> Is that no longer the quid pro quo? I just, well, I, I it's not a quid pro quo. I said at uh, with Wolf, I said, you know, uh, it's funny, we did put out the 2014 taxes and Secretary Clinton didn't put out her transcripts. We made as much in a year as she made in an hour. Right. You're going to see that play out every year. Um, I just think that it, it would be nice to do that. I have a question for you. Have you, we, her answer is it's, she wants to stay with the standard. It should apply to absolutely everybody. The person she's running against has not given any Wall Street um, speeches that were paid to hundred thousand dollars or even two dollars so that's this election but have you asked the Republicans if any of them have given paid speeches to Wall Street over the last say ten years for two hundred thousand dollars and to and ask them to release them if they have I'm, I'm hundred percent for full disclosure on all these matters from uh, speaking personally on Hillary Clinton's part and on all Republicans people are giving paid speeches if the transcripts exist they should be put out I'm for that let me just be real clear about the last thing about the taxes though you said a bunch of your taxes are now in with an accountant again you, I, just how many years and when will we see them oh no I just well first off I, I just finished the t 2015 and I've given them some back ones to look at um, I, when when they're done, I just dropped them off today, this morning, <laughs> uh, the 2015 ones, which I did. And I don't think Secretary Clinton has put out her 2015 either. But, I think they will be a little bit different. But you didn't answer my question. Well, yeah, yeah. Have you yeah. asked the Republicans whether they've given any Wall Street speeches for $200,000 or more, and will they I release I, them? I don't, think any, I don't think any of them have. Although, but, but again, just to tie this up, we've got 15 seconds, just yes or no. Is releasing your tax returns contingent on Secretary Clinton's? No, no, no. it's no, not contingent. No, no, okay. no, okay. no. All right, Jane, thank no, you very much. No, but I think it would be fair. Yep, understood. All right, Jane Sanders, thank you. We'll be right back with more after this. With Donald J. Trump, billionaire, on track to collect the 1,237 delegates he needs for the Republican nomination, some people are floating various scenarios about ways that bound anti-Trump delegates might try to thwart a first ballot coronation at the Republican convention in Cleveland this summer. To see just how plausible some of these scenarios are, we called in Republican super lawyer and rules aficionado, Ben Ginsburg, who joins us from our Washington bureau. Uh, ben, good to see you. Let's start with this first uh, scenario that's been floated, which is the credential challenge. Um, is it possible that the 1237 threshold could change if entire de delegations get challenged and tossed? Possible, but unlikely. I mean, the procedures would be you'd file a credentials challenge. Rule 101 of convention management is to be sure as many of your opponents uh, delegates are subject to challenge as yours are. Have you seen anything, Ben, in the conduct of the elections that would leave them open to a potentially successful challenge? Uh, I've not been at all the state conventions, and the challenges that were successful four years ago and uh, 12 years ago all involved 
challenges to um, to procedures at state conventions for the most part. All right, let's talk about the second scenario that was discussed in uh, Kim Strassel's Wall Street Journal column this morning. This notion that people could be bound delegates, but be in effect conscientious objectors and basically say, I don't think I should vote for Donald Trump on the first ballot, even though the, uh, under the rules I'm supposed to, because I don't like the process or I don't think I should. Is there any chance anybody could get away with that? In other words, if I'm a delegate, a Trump delegate, and I just stand up and I say, I'm not voting for Trump, is there any way you can get away with that? I think probably not. Rule 16 will bind the delegates to reflect the votes of the presidential uh, preference uh, votes in their state. And so that count should actually be known with a fair degree of specificity actually on June 8th. There is a scenario where the convention could try and unbind all the delegates. That would mean saying that the voices of all the voters didn't count. So it is possible for a convention to do something like that, but also highly unlikely. But Ben, doesn't that beg the question of why we even have the convention? If, if the vote is already known and no one can switch their vote, if Trump, has, if Trump is recorded by the, by the primaries and caucuses and other parts of the process of having a majority, why are the delegates there? Well, they're, they're, the main reason for having the convention is to get all the most dedicated Republicans together in one place to be able to have unity, okay, sorry. Let, to be able let to come me, up with a platform. Counselor, let me, re, let me rephrase my question. Why have the oh, roll? I love it when you do this. Why have the roll call vote for the presidential pre, pre, uh, preference then, for the presidential you know <laughs> ballot counting? What? Well, the, re the reason to do that is more one of history, to give somebody from every state the ability to do it. Remember that the rules all call for the vice presidential vote to be by acclamation if there's only one candidate. So if there's more than one name put in nomination, you obviously have to have the roll call. And secondly, it has the unifying purpose of letting a representative from each state give those speeches we, um, we all love to see. Yes, I do like that. All, right, all right, Ben, let me ask you about a third scenario, not wild different from the one that Mark asked a second ago about conscientious objection. What about abstention? Um, what about a bound delegate who gets up and just says, uh, I abstain on the first ballot? Is that something you can do? Under the rules as they exist now, and I don't believe are subject to amendment, the, uh, the secretary is required to record the vote as the delegates are bound by their state. So, in other words, that will, that will not work. But you're missing the good scenarios for messing around with this. All right, All right. we're going to get to those in a All moment. Right, let's try this scenario, see if you like this one. The no-show scenario. Let's say uh, Mike Pence decides he doesn't want, uh, it, you know, delegates in his state that went for tr the Trump wins Indiana. He doesn't want them to. So he takes all the delegates and the alternates. They just don't show up on the night of the roll call for the presidency. What happens then? Well, again, the way the rule currently reads is that the secretary is required to record the vote as it took place in the state, as the voters of that state said in the presidential preference vote. All right. So this is the, now we're getting. So Cleveland has great shopping, but not going to work. All right. So we gave you a whole bunch of scenarios that other people have laid out and you basically dismissed them all and said they're implausible. However, you've rather tantalizingly suggested that there are other ways to make mischief. So we'll ask you what those are now so that the never Trump's forces can watch the this videotape over and over again. What are the ways that you could really mess up that first ballot? Even if Trump goes into the convention ostensibly with a majority. Yeah, so look, these are the, the lessons learned from 2012, and it's what, when I was uh, representing Mitt Romney, we were worried about. Number one is Rule 40 D and E that talk about how you have to have a majority of the delegates uh, to win. A one word amendment to that rule can achieve Donald Trump's goal if he's shy by making it a plurality of delegates. On the other hand, the Convention Rules Committee could vote and say it has to be a supermajority of delegates for the first ballot. That would be that would be one place to do it. But how could you could, could also could, could, they, could there any way the anti Trump forces could make that rule change? Well, see, here's what's interesting about it. It depends who, first of all, the delegates are, and more specifically, who are the delegates on the Rules Committee? Who is going to control the two delegates from each state and territory who are on the Rules Committee, and are they willing to take a vote like that, either to plurality or, or supermajority? You don't know yet because the delegates for those committees have, by and large, not right. been named, and, so, and, and you don't know who their loyalties and so, are And to. so you could have people who are in the category of which there are going to be many. Someone could be a Trump delegate put on the Rules Committee, really and yet Cruz. doesn't want Trump to be the nominee right. and could change the rules in a way. Right. Those, 
the, importantly, those delegates are bound for the presidential vote. They are not bound, bound for the rules, for rules issues, credentials right. issues, for platform issues, which is something also to talk about, right. or even the vice presidential vote. Ben, you got 30 more seconds to lay out some more mischief scenarios, so go. Uh, well, you change Rule 40B and make it much easier to nominate uh, people to be able to give floor speeches and have the regularly scheduled uh, spontaneous demonstrations on the floor. Uh, you might send a message to, through the vice presidential vote. Uh, you might, uh, in effect, do something with the credentials that we talked about before. Right. You can send messages on the platform as well. All right, Ben, your 30 seconds are up. Thank you for uh, providing <laughs> us with an instruction on how uh, most of these scenarios are ridiculous. However, there are other scenarios that could cause havoc and a lot of excitement. Ben Ginsburg, thank you for coming here. Uh, you're great. Coming up, we're one commercial stop away from Legoland, sort of. Uh, wait until you see our diorama of the White House Correspondents' Dinner. How does the White House Correspondents' Dinner work? We explain with Legos. It's been held here at the Washington Hilton every year since 1968. Guests tend to arrive around 6 at T Street Northwest, what's known as the Reagan Entrance, the site of the assassination attempt of President Reagan in 1981. Then there's a red carpet, a lot of paparazzi here. The cocktail receptions start around this time. There's some on the main floor, where there's a mix of journalists, politicians, business leaders, and celebrities. There are more parties downstairs, and the president himself attends a VIP reception. Downstairs is also where the main ballroom is. Guests line up outside the room, about 2,500 of them, and everyone has to go through security. Then the actual dinner starts. The president will be there, naturally. And this year, so will Bernie Sanders. Not attending, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, as of now. The president goes on a little later. He's the opening act for a comedian. When the comic is done, everyone is frozen in place until the president leaves. And then the real party starts. The after party. Very nice. That's what's happening tomorrow night. Let's pause, though, for a second and reflect on the blockbuster week that has just passed. Here's a quick recap of all the action, the drama, the twisting plot lines, double crossings, and, of course, the absurdities of the past five days. Enjoy. Ted Cruz and John Kasich have hashed out a rare bargain to help each other try to stop Donald J. Trump billionaire from the Republican nomination. I don't see this as any big deal other than the fact that I'm not going to spend resources in Indiana. He's not going to spend them in other places. So what? What's the big deal? In politics, you're allowed to collude. So they colluded. And actually, I was happy because it shows how weak they are. It shows how pathetic they are. Donald Trump is on a right now on a not on a glide path. He's got a he's got a, an achievable but difficult goal to get to 1237. Every delegate counts. And for those guys to not be strategic would be stupid. They're called the Acela primaries. But what does that mean? What well, some are calling the Acela primary. The Acela primary. The accelerated primary. Is it Acela train, Melissa? Yes. Acela train. It's called the Ace LA primary. Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Delaware, Rhode Island, and Maryland get their say in the presidential nomination race. And all signs point to another very victorious evening for Donald J. Trump, billionaire, and Hillary R. Clinton, not quite billionaire. Thank you. Pennsylvania! When you crack 60 with three people, that's very hard to do. In fact, I think Chris can tell you if you crack 60 with two people, that's called, that's called a massive landslide. I have come to the conclusion that if I am nominated to be President of the United States, that I will run on a ticket with my vice presidential nominee, Carly Fiorina. It's a desperate act of a desperate campaign. I think the press will say this is a negative net because it looks desperate. I think it's a net positive. Donald J. Trump, billionaire, gave a speech very different tone, tenor, and tempo than his typical exercises and oratorical excess. It's time to shake the rust off America's foreign policy. It's time to invite new voices and new visions into the fold. America First will be the major and overriding theme of my administration. So I thought it was I thought it was perfectly good compared to a Hillary Clinton foreign policy speech or George Bush foreign policy speech. Oh, fine. come on. Come on. 
an interview with the Today Show this morning, Trump repeated his claim that Hillary Clinton would not be a viable presidential candidate or even a city council candidate if she weren't playing the, quote, woman card, end quote. Lucifer in the flesh, that's the political phrase of the day. I said it with you. And what former Speaker of the House John Boehner, a Republican, called Ted Cruz last night in an event in California. He said, quote, I have never worked with a more miserable son of a bitch in my life. A second day in a row of disruptive protests outside Donald Trump events. That was not the easiest entrance I've ever made. My wife called, she said, there are helicopters following you, and we did, and then we went under a fence and through a fence, and oh boy, I felt like I was crossing the border, actually. All in one week, wow. All right, up next, what did Tom Hanks and the gods of rock and roll have in common? We'll show you right after this quick break. Tomorrow night, as we just discussed, is the White House Correspondents' Dinner in Washington, D.C. But for any music lovers not going to the dinner or watching the proceedings on C-SPAN, there is another option on ye old television. Tomorrow night at 8 p.m., HBO airing its annual broadcast of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony, which took place three weeks ago at the Barclays Center in my home borough, my beloved home, Brooklyn. In this show's brief lifetime, one of its most treasured privileges and traditions has been to venture backstage and shoot the rehearsals for that event, as well as the ceremony itself. In the wake of Prince's death last week, and in a year that we've also lost music legends such as David Bowie, Glenn Fry, and Fife Dog, the Rock Hall inductions are a reminder that in a world where politics is often so wretchedly divisive and polarizing, pop culture can still create ecstatic moments of unity, community, and joy. I think the whole set of cheap trick at the end is going to kill people. At the end, this is going to kill them. It's going to be like baby boomer Nirvana here. <laughs> We are here in Brooklyn, New York at the Barclays Center on the night of the 31st annual Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. In a couple of hours, this room will be full to the rafters to hear some incredible bands this year's inductees, Cheap Trick, the Steve Miller Band, Deep Purple, Chicago, and NWA. One more. One more. I mean, two. So we're here on stage, standing in front of one of the most kind of awesome sights you could possibly see. This is Rick Nielsen's guitars. The five neck. The five neck, and it's heavy. That's what I've, I, I, I won't pick it up because it's like Lost Ark, you know what I mean? You don't want to like end up no, you don't bursting touch, into flames. You don't want to touch that. I'm here with Matt Nathanson, who's a, a, a celebrated musician uh, unto himself. So Rick Nielsen has been, what I know is that he's been collecting guitars way before it was cool to collect vintage guitars. When he was a kid, there's a great story about, I guess he went and saw Jeff Beck play and he watched Jeff Beck's guitar tech drop a guitar and snap the headstock off. Yeah. And so he reached over kind of through the barricade and gave Jeff Beck's tech his card and said, hey man, I deal guitars if you want. And then he came over to his house, like yeah. literally to his house, yeah. and then Rick sold him two Les Pauls, I think. Right, that is incredible. It's that's, nuts. That's an incredible story. I mean, these are amazing. I'll show you the other thing that I think is amazing is this. Dude, look at all the Microphone, picks. look at the picks. He throws them out by that handful. I know, you wanna know how, you know, wanna know how promiscuous he is about the picks? That's how promiscuous. Uh, he stuck that one to your forehead, by the I way. I have one. I have one. Oh, well, yeah, I wanna be free. Keep on rocking me, baby. Keep on rocking me, baby. I just wanna make sure you don't need anything else. For the first time in a long time, we have four out of five existing bands that are continually touring on the road all the time, and they're gonna play a soundtrack of 70s, 80s hits for everybody.
It's a time traveling right. machine. Okay. You go back to Deep Purple, that's my brother and his friends in our bedroom yeah. telling me to shut up and yeah. get out of the room. Yeah. Uh, Chicago, that's all the cute girls on the yearbook staff who would have nothing to do to me. Yeah. They would be listening yeah. to Chicago. Yeah. So it's not about where we are today, it's yeah. about where we were in the day. The closing number tonight is Ain't That a Shame, and what's great about the closing number is the anybody who's like here, basically, all these amazing musicians, they can all come up on stage and they all play together and do this thing. So should we get Cheryl out here too? Hey, Okay, we'll put those kicks in there. Great, okay. Something with a 16th notes that everybody can play together. With all due respect, we're... It's nearly showtime. That's the sound of the finale being rehearsed. Let's go. I'm looking forward to the arc, the arc, yeah. from Steve Miller yeah. to NWA. Right. Rock and roll, not just as a specific genre of music, but as rock and roll as the uh, evolutionary force I, that it was. Man, I love it when you're spewing this kind of bullshit. Uh, wait a minute, no, I have, wait a minute. Let me just show you my one thing. I'm very proud of this. Okay. I have my executive producing lam oh! laminate, well, I man. got one of those two Can I show you what I got right here? What do you got? I got a guitar pick from Rick Nielsen. From Cheap Trick. That's a, that's a, you Rick, know what? That's a Rick Nielsen guitar pick right he there. He told that's me. That's a real thing. That oh, you got one too. Rick Nielsen guitar pick was his favorite. Right. Pick. Oh, okay. Well, he didn't tell me that. He just gave me one. He intimated to me that he may have to come and get this from me before he can do his set. Yeah. Hey, John, thanks. Do you need, hey, John, you need your pick back? I got it. Hey, 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 Enjoy the show. is, are we rock and roll? Yes. And I say you got damn right we rock and roll. Yeah. Rock and roll is not an instrument. Rock and roll is not even a style of music. Rock and roll is a spirit. It's a spirit. It's been going since the blues, jazz, bebop, Soul, R&B, rock and roll, heavy metal, punk rock, and yes, hip hop. <laughs> rock and roll is not conforming to the people who came before you, but creating your own path in music and in life. That is rock and roll, and that is us. Huge, vast, ginormous thanks to the great Gary Getzman, our friends at HBO and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for letting us do this thing. Again, the special premieres on HBO tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you can find it after that on HBO Go. We will be right back. Check out BloombergPolitics.com for all your 2016 presidential campaign coverage needs. There's amazing stories all over that website every time. Coming up on Bloomberg TV's flagship tech show, Emily Chang sits down with LinkedIn CEO Jeff Weiner. Until tomorrow, actually not until tomorrow, we're not here till Monday. So until Monday, I say to you on behalf of me and Mark Halperin, that fabled word, sayonara.